Hello and welcome to our eSports webinar today. It is Wednesday if you need a COVID-19 day check. My name is Ed Walton. I'm CEO of StepCG. We're a leading uh, IT solution and managed services provider based in Covington, Kentucky. We're excited to be hosting this session on eSports today, which is really a global phenomenon. And we're doing this with our partner Extreme Networks. And I want to note Katie Johnson, and Michelle Crowley's contact info here. If you could send your contact info to them or put it in the chat window, we'll be sending out additional content related to today's presentation, and we'll also have some follow on trainings and upcoming events on eSports we'll keep you informed on. And also, let's keep this interactive. You can ask questions in the uh, chat window. Next slide. So a quick commercial on who Step CG is. You know, really at Step CG, sporting education, both K through 12 and higher ed, it's in our DNA and we've been doing it a long time, certainly across the Commonwealth of Kentucky, but really nationwide. And what we're all about is, is we're an engineering firm first and foremost, and we bring best in breed technology approach with expertise in wireline, wireless, and LTE cellular and some of the emerging technologies like private LTE and CBRS. We're agile, we're flexible, really focused on the customer experience and success. And we like to think of ourselves as a partner, not a vendor. And we're focused on real business outcomes and ROI. So we look forward to following up on an engagement post this seminar today and get you additional information, but certainly would like to meet you. Next slide. And when I think about eSports and Extreme Networks, they go hand in hand. Extreme is a leader in cloud-driven end-to-end networking solutions that really enable eSports programs and make sure there's an optimal user experience. So going to the next slide, I wanna thank our presenters today. We've got Robert Kwiatkowski from Extreme Networks, and then we have two pioneers and leaders in the eSports arena in Randy Siminski, Director of Athletics and Recreation and Intramurals at SUNY Canton, and Kyle Brown, Chief Information Officer at SUNY Canton. I really think you're gonna enjoy hearing their story and their journey and what they have to share about eSports. Robert? Thanks, Ed. Next slide. So today we're gonna look at uh, these handful of things, focusing on technology of esports. Uh, first, we're going to go quickly through uh, a network focus. What does it take to build a network? Things you need to think about when you're uh, building a network for esports. Uh, we'll look at an esports case study with SUNY Canton, and then we'll uh, have SUNY Canton talk about college enrollment, recruitment, and marketing. And then we'll get into what the what's the future look like for esports uh, in the industry. Uh, please also take note, uh, there's a lot of information, case studies, um, you know, network design, white papers, and things like that around eSports on our website. Next slide. So when you think about eSports, if, uh, you know, if you were around in the 80s, um, not so much 90s, a little bit, but uh, this is the traditional perception for us older folks uh, around video gaming. It's, it's the arcades and uh, or you know, sitting on the couch with with your friends and family playing, you know, Wii, uh, PlayStation, Xbox, things like that. Uh, next slide. But this is really what esports is, uh, or actually was and will be again, right? So uh, before our uh, you know COVID nineteen situation right now, they were really packing in the arenas. Uh, I mean, full capacity for esports games um, all over the nation, all over the world. And, uh, you know, this is the reality of it. Some of the uh, payouts were like $3 million for Fortnite for the winner, and then $3 million per player for uh, Dota, uh, which was a team game much like Overwatch. So they paid out $33 million. And all the big uh, companies out there are getting into uh, esports in one, uh, one way, shape or form. They're they're doing something with it. You'll see a lot more of esports on TV. Um, it's happening now, and you'll see more in the future. Next slide. So, what's esports look like today in our situation? 
um, it's actually booming. It's, uh, you know, students are at home. Uh, SUNY actually put on, is it's happening right now with a SUNY uh, Chancellor Esports Challenge. And uh, it's going out for the next few weeks and we can have Canton uh, talk about that because they were asked to head it up and uh, lead that lead that tournament. But you can see that, uh, you know, this is something to engage the students, getting uh, them, you know, uh, off the <laughs> engaged and, and having some fun in, in this situation, right? Uh, you'll see some things over here with uh, League of Legends being broadcast on ESPN. You're going to see a lot of esports on ESPN. I think they have uh, the NBA, NBA 2K going on as well. And then uh, iRacing is uh, really taking off. Um, so those are some things that are happening today. I don't know, Canton, if you have anything here on, uh, on the Chancellor Challenge you want to mention? Kyle? Sure. So yeah, this is a was an interesting endeavor. Uh, we have, I believe, a total of 46 campuses participating now, uh, and um, uh, you know this really came out of the need to engage our students across the system um, while they were you know hunkered down and quarantining at home. Uh, and that's the beauty of esports. Uh, you know, you don't need a, a million dollar arena to play. Uh, you can be in your bedroom at home with with a, uh, a, a standard uh, PC and still get that gaming experience playing with uh, with your friends from. Uh, across the state or across the country. Yeah, the biggest complaint we've had with the tournament is that schools are being overwhelmed by students who want to participate. So that's a great complaint to have, right? So it's been really fun to get that going. We have 500 students participating, uh, nearly 500 in this tournament, and it's just been fantastic. And a lot of schools have said, you know, we really need to establish esports programs because the interest and demand from students uh, is just incredible. We've never had uh, anything that I've done or been affiliated with the school that has had this type of passionate response and demand from students. So our, we're fortunate that our school has uh, responded so well to it, and it's been great to spread that throughout the SUNY system in New York. Yeah, it's great. It's uh, actually streaming live. I think it starts, is it, is it 7 p.m. every night? It's Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 7. We had our first day of competition on Monday, which was terrific. We have uh, our second day today. It's kind of like a round robin play in week this week and then we'll start with eliminations next week. Yep, so you can you can tune in on Twitch um, or just Google uh, SUNY Esports Chancellor Challenge and uh, you, you should be able to find a lot of information on that. Um, so next slide please. All right, so esports and higher education today. Uh, currently, there are over 145 schools with institutional uh, supported programs. I think that that's this is a little bit older slide, so I think that's actually increased. Um, and the average program startup timeline, the average program startup timeline is 12 to 18 months. This is if you don't have anyone like Step CG, um, Extreme, you know, helping you out. But uh, I think we can improve those timelines. Um, Randy, how long did it take us to uh, for SUNY Canton to get your program going? Sorry, I had myself muted. It was a whirlwind, right? I, you know, most schools take a, a lot longer. You know, some schools will take up to a year or even a year and a half. I think we turned ours around in less than a month, to be honest with you. It was amazing. We started with, uh, you know, without an esports arena, we started some real grassroots, but we just sent an email out to students. Actually, we started with an old fashioned sign up sheet at one point, and we had over 50 signatures in that the first couple of days of the sign-up sheet we sent an email out to students and just got bombarded but yeah the startup really we turned it around in four weeks or so and we started competing and it, it's just grown from there all right uh, next slide so uh we we actually went out and did a study so you see here global esports economy topped a billion dollars for the first time in 2019 uh, we'll have to look at the numbers uh, coming this year to see what it's done over the past year. There is a, uh, and, and here we go, we're, we're noting that uh, $3 million solo winner there for Fortnite. Um, so there is a high school esports league, uh, and I want to note something in there. It, it has the lowercase e, capital S. Uh, we don't, that's actually incorrect. Sorry about that. It's actually a capital E, lowercase sports 
uh, when used in a title or used in the beginning of a sentence, and you have to use the uh, lowercase e s p o r t s in a sentence. <laughs> um, so the high school esports league that already has 1,700 school districts and 45,000 participating students. So that's something to really look at if you're K-12. Um, so eCampus, we did a study there. Do you have an esports program? 21% said yes, and 79% said no. So are you considering adding an esports program at your school? 26% uh, said yes, and 45% said maybe, and 29% said no. Again, this was done a handful of months ago, and we'll have to see if those numbers change. Uh, stay tuned for new updates on that this year, but those were the numbers over this past, um, in, you know, 2019, 2020 timeframe. Uh, next slide. So let's get into the technology of esports. Uh, next slide. So there's three critical pillars for an arena, and it's all about design, computing, and the infrastructure. So when you look at the room, um, you know, Kyle, Randy can add some color here. But uh, they did some uh, studies and talking to students. You really want to engage uh, the students and, and the coach on the room for uh, logistics and, and space. I think they were looking at somewhere around three feet for workspace, but they found that one student uh, had this large mouse pad and had, had the mouse settings really low, so he was using a lot of space. So I think you went to four feet. Is that right? About four feet workspace? That's correct, yeah. Four feet. And then lighting. Um, lighting was uh, critical with uh, also the paint finish on the walls. Instead of using some glossy, you had to use like a, a satin or a, not even a satin, like a matte finish with um, indirect lighting. Yeah, that's correct. So that was an interesting endeavor. You know, it was our, our first time, uh, you know, building a competitive space like this. Typically, when we build out a technology rich environment, it's, it's more of a like a, a CAD lab or, you know, a high end computer lab. Uh, so some of the design aspects were were kind of new to us, um, as as you mentioned, Rob. The you know we needed matte paint because we were finding that there was too much light bouncing off the walls uh, and interrupting um, the vision in the monitors. Um, the four feet of space uh, was required because of uh, you know the competitive nature. Students needed that that room with that low D DPI on the mouse. Um, indirect lighting was key. Uh, the room had uh, you know the standard fluorescent lights, and we found it was just uh, entirely too harsh, both in um, uh, you know a, a bounce aspect, but also you know the students being in there for multiple hours at a time playing, uh, it, it uh, caused a lot of eye fatigue. So indirect lighting, RGB lighting, you'll see in in the picture on the right, uh, we have um, RGB light strips behind all the TV panels on the walls. We actually have RGB lights uh, on the ceiling that shine upwards and create a glow in the room, and all the computers are backlit um, with with LEDs on them. So we can actually turn off all overhead lighting and have uh, reduced eye strain for the players um, by, by having all this indirect lighting. So, yeah, the design was uh, was was probably what we stumbled upon uh, as we started building this. We were thinking of the structure and compute, um, but actually, in, in my opinion, the design piece turned out to be one of the most important aspects. Yeah, absolutely. Randy, uh, I, I remember you compliment, um, making a, uh, a comment on the space where, you know, like football teams and baseball teams, they huddle up and they look at the whiteboard. I don't know if you have anything there you want to add. Yeah, I'd recommend trying to, if you have the space, to leave a little room for that. You know, we take out the uh, dry erase board, it's on wheels, and, and we uh, give pre-game, pre-match speeches, just like you would if you were a football coach or a basketball coach, and there's X's and O's up there, and they're strategizing against the other teams. They'd scout other teams beforehand. It's just like traditional athletics in that regard. So that's uh, something to consider as well. Awesome. Little coaching room. And, and what you can't see in, in these pictures, actually, it's behind the perspective of the person taking the picture, is a shout casting station. And attached to that on the wall, we have an 85 inch uh, 4K LCD. Um, and that's uh, for game review. So the players can huddle around it and, and rewatch their matches and strategize as well. Great. So we're going to get into the computing and infrastructure in the next handful of slides. Um, so, next slide, please. All right, so the eSports Arena, just a, a brief uh, description. It's uh, 1,800 square feet, and uh, it says two-story room. It's, uh, that's you know ceiling height, right? So um, 24 gaming stations, uh, Alienware Area 51 with Threadripper, uh, some really high-end compute, 
Uh, we'll get into uh, that piece of it when it comes to a network perspective, but some really high end compute with great graphic cards. Um, we also tested out, uh, we're actually in testing with uh, dual uh, network adapters because uh, you want to have a resilient uh, infrastructure uh, right from the computer through the network and out to the internet. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so, you know, there's the uh, 80 inch 4K LCD mentioned there as well. Um, next slide. All right, so when we're looking at the network and network focus, we're really thinking about latency and that's number one. Um, yes, resiliency, you know, you have to have that foundation of a, a resilient network. But when you're looking at the network performance, it's all about latency. Uh, the students can actually notice the difference between 10, 15 milliseconds. So the average um, is around 40 to 60 milliseconds. And if you can do better than that, uh, you know, that's going to help uh, the gamer in uh, reaction times and things like that. So it'll give you a little bit more competitive advantage. Visibility, knowing do I have an application issue? Do I have a network issue? Uh, having some visibility into how the game is performing. There's some in-game stats and things like that we'll get into. And then security. Um, we always have to talk about security in everything we do when we're building data networks. And then that path to the cloud, not just cloud or ISP, but what's that path look like to that service? Um, you know, let's, let's say Overwatch with Blizzard.net. And then tools, um, the tools used. You know, what's network management look like to make it easy, um, you know, to get those analytics uh, and for troubleshooting and monitoring. Uh, make sure that, that we're delivering a high quality and consistent gamer experience. Next slide. OK, so when we're looking at latency and jitter. Um, so latency is, is basically the measure measurement of you know, how long does it take to get to that resource and back? So what's that millisecond delay? Jitter is how consistent is that performance, right? Or is it bouncing all over the place? And we don't want that. We, we want low latency and no jitter. Uh, so in the games, uh, in those in-game stats, they have interpolation delay measurements which is really an attempt to measure um, as a gamer does an action on a keyboard or a mouse uh, all the way through to the resource, you know, through the computer, through the network, through to the ISP, to that resource and back and visually represented on the screen for that gamer. So there's um, there's been some if, if you've read any of the uh, gamer forums or uh, any blogs, you'll see that uh, I think I was in one, it was Overwatch, and they were upset because they combined two of these measurements and they weren't able to see if they had an application issue or a network issue. So we want to give them the tools to get that visibility, not only live right now what's going on, but have that historical data so they can go back and look at league, um, league play or tournaments they had in the past. Next slide. So here's a little bit, uh, I think this builds out. Katie, if you want to click one more, it'll put a little circle up on the left. There you go. That's uh, actually the in-game stats you can turn on. Uh, so when you're in the game, you can look at the frames per second. It gives you a little bit of information on, on how the computer's performing and things like that. So the gamer knows you know, what's going on as they're playing, if there's any, uh, any issues going on. Uh, you can turn these on in the options panel of a game. And this is Overwatch. And uh, down below you see the the green yellow red um, we have the ability with extreme networks to differentiate between application response time and network response time so are you having an application issue or is it network related why is this important because in some games some of the rules that are out there uh, if, if a player drops out it could be a computer issue or network issue they might not be able to allow it to come back into the game or you might be able to pause the game uh, some some leagues will allow you to pause up to five minutes, which you can imagine in in uh, esports is probably an eternity, right? So that's a gracious five minutes, and you really don't want to go there if, if you have to. Um, so we have to build that resilient infrastructure, and uh, that's kind of one of the points I wanted to make here. And we have to have, you know, where is the problem? We have to have that visibility. Uh, next slide. So when we're looking at security. <clears throat> um, 
You know, I, I actually went out to battle.net here, uh, Looking Glass, and I found that these IP addresses were actually out in the right network. And uh, for some, you know, schools, some businesses, they actually uh, will block uh, certain subnets across the globe. Uh, some have a lot of uh, cyber warfare going on, DDoS attacks and things like that. So firewall rules, you know, 101 is to block certain subnets out there and maybe allow you know adjunct fac faculty that might be working abroad uh, to gain access in but uh, something to be you know uh, to think about is you might have to open up some ip addresses so now when you do that okay uh, maybe we want to segment the esports uh, network off right um you know so that we can do better security that way now i mentioned in some of the forums where they're you know not getting what they're looking for in terms of application response time and network response time so they're downloading things like zenmap and nmap which you know in the in the wrong hands some of these tools are used for you know hacking you know mapping out your networking launching uh, larger attacks so again security um, being able to secure the network with uh, policy-based, role-based policy on our switches, things like that, um, segmenting them off, and uh, you know something to think about with firewall configurations, and uh, you know just wanted to point that out. Um, oh, another point is a lot of you know there's a lot of smart students out there might be in the CIS program, and um, you know there's some good ones and some bad ones out there. They might launch a DDoS attack, just saying uh, against another team at the right time during a game so you might want to think about uh not you know getting an ip range for that arena um if you're really thinking about being competitive here uh you know under a different name maybe right so uh when they go out to aaron they type in uh, your school name they don't get a list of your ip addresses uh, just something i've been kicking around with some folks uh, of recent you know past couple months it's potential. I'm not saying it's happening, but it, you know, it could happen. Next slide. All right, so a network focus on uh, cloud and ISP. So according to the PC Magazine Game Quality Index, they actually created a Game Quality Index. Uh, if you look every year, this top, what is that, the top 10? Yeah, the top 10 changes. Uh, so ISPs are always making changes to improve their networks, but sometimes uh, some improvements uh, for you might be that there's an additional hop, um, which adds latency. So you might have 20 milliseconds today when you uh, talk to your ISP, get a new internet connection, but tomorrow you have, might have 30, it might go to 40, it might go to 50. Uh, so the point here is uh, make sure you have some type of service level, level agreement in your internet uh, service. Maybe not go one year, uh, or three years, five years, maybe do one year um, contracts. But if you do multi-year, make sure you get that SLA in there. Might even make sense to have two internet connections and maybe some SD-WAN technology in there to choose the best path. Because uh, if things change, you want to always make sure that you know, you're getting that best latency and, and jitter, that best performance. Next slide. Okay, so cloud uh, ISP looking at content delivery networks. Um, so content delivery networks are basically, to summarize, uh, pushing the content, pushing the information closer to that end user, closer to that gamer. Uh, so look at the content delivery networks that are available to you in your area. And, um, you know, this definitely improves performance and it, it uh, you know, it's something to really consider as you're playing in the game. Uh, if you're just walking in a game, let's say a battle game like Overwatch, um, you know you'll you'll be just walking in the in the latencies uh, a little lower. Some of the stats I found here in the um, uh, online, I think we could provide some of this uh, some of these links here. Maybe put up a site or something like that. Um, but it it actually changes as they battle as more as more avatars get in in an area and they're battling, uh, the latency goes up. So we, we definitely want to look at content delivery networks. I think here in New York, Kyle, we're looking at uh, Nizernet. I don't know if you have any color on Nizernet. Yep, that is correct. Nizernet is our, our state education and research network, uh, and we do have a, a, a 10 gig connection uh, to that network at our campus, and we do utilize their CDN service uh, for our gaming traffic um, amongst some other traffic. 
OK, great. Uh, next slide. And this one bills out, Katie, one more click. OK, so uh, really we're highlighting, uh, you know, our network tools at this point. Uh, Extreme Management Center, our campus fabric, which is highly resilient and uh, used by, I think we have close to between 1,500 and 2,000 uh, large fabric deployments across the world. And our services support rank number one because, you know, you got to have the people behind you to support you. So calling in, uh, collapsing those tiers of support levels and, and getting right to a resource immediately that can assist you with any issues. Uh, we really tout that Extreme has the, you know, is ranked number one with service and support. And having that single place for that granular visibility we've been talking about, being able to know if you have any issues with application or network uh, response times, knowing where those problems might be. So take a look at Extreme Management Center. Uh, next slide. Okay, so when you look at a campus, and this might be a little different for, you know, K-12 or higher ed, depending on how large your campuses are, but if, you know, you have your edge, you have your wireless and where computers are plugging in, and then you have your campus, which is your backbone back to your uh, data center, which is uh, then connected to the internet. So when we put all this together, if you want to build that slide out now, Katie, it's all about insights, right? If you can't see it, you can't manage it. So what we're doing is we're we're feeding information from end to end, data center to edge, into our machine learning and artificial intelligence um, cloud IQ, extreme cloud IQ. And we're going to be able to adapt and leverage the, the cloud compute power out there. Think of it as an elastic brain. It's it's infinitely, um, you know, as much compute as we need is there, right? So we can crunch a lot of data very quickly to get those insights. So I, uh, when you tie these together, you're going to get security, automation, those insights and analytics uh, to help uh, make decisions. And that's what we, we we're talking about cloud driven, right? One of the pieces, management and orchestration and an open ecosystem. So being able to integrate with uh, third party devices. So anything that happens in and around esports, we're going to be able to adapt very quickly because we have open APIs that can integrate and pull information in or feed information to some other system. Uh, next slide, please. And we'll just build this one out. This is really kind of just, um, you go ahead and click. I think there's a few more in there. Yeah. We'll just build this one right out, Katie. There you go. All right, so <laughs> this is a, a huge eye chart. Um, think of this as the periodic table of elements uh, from extreme, right? So the whole point here is, you know, we're looking, we have, uh, you know, pieces in our toolbox, right? You can't just fix a car with a single tool. You, you bring out the tools to fix that car, the right tools, right? So you look at the solution, you look at the problem, and you bring those right tools out. So we have large toolboxes uh, with, with a lot of tools in them. So when we focus on the human element, human element being the, the gamer in esports, what does their world look like and what do we need to support those games, those computers, that environment, um, and then back it with services and support. Um, that's really the focus. So, you know, we're looking at cloud driven infrastructure. We're looking at management pieces and then that, that you know, that physical switch and uh, the high, um, you know, high performance ac uh, wireless access that we have. It's worth mentioning that we are the official Wi-Fi provider of the NFL and analytics. So if we can do, you know, 70,000 fans in a stadium, uh, we can absolutely handle uh, an esports arena. Next slide. Yep, complete software, hardware, and human solutions. All right, next slide. So yeah, so focus on the gamer. This is Emily from SUNY Canton. She's a rock star uh, for, for their team. And uh, it's been a pleasure working with SUNY Canton and putting those right elements together for their esports arena. Um, so, you know, the service and support human element is uh, number one. Next slide. And I think I'm going to pass it off to Kyle for esports case study. Sure, thanks. I think the first, uh, first slide uh, is. Randy, was this yours? Sure, I guess I could give folks a quick overview of 
uh, what SUNY Canton is all about. Uh, you know, for a college, we're a smaller school. We're just over 3,000 students, and that's split up with about a third of our students on campus, a third of our students as commuters, and about a third online. And so we're a pretty diverse school in regards to that aspect and diverse uh, all the way around, really. We are very rural. Uh, we're in a small um, town in upstate New York, about 15 miles from the Canadian border. 40% of our students come from this rural area and another 40% of our students come from New York City. So we have quite a mix of students and that's reflected on our esports team as well. You know, that's the one great thing about the esports team. It's a great melting pot. We, we, it, it, it goes over uh, geography and uh, race, religion, uh, everything. Um, students nowadays game and uh, all of them game. One thing is a challenge. We want to we want to try to include more women participating in esports. That's been a challenge, but we're going. I think once we embrace this uh, K through 12 and higher ed, that that's going to change significantly. We just need to embrace that and uh, recruit women into our uh, games just like they did in the 70s with athletics and it's going to open up the open up the floodgates for them to participate and really do well but that's a little bit about uh, SUNY Canton we're a smaller school um, we don't have an abundance of resources we're a public school but we managed to make this work we'll go to the next slide so there's all sorts of reasons really why we we lost an esports program and it happened really quickly. Uh, but uh, for the most part, our president looked at how athletics was going at SUNY Canton. He looked at the GPAs were higher than the uh, normal student body. Um, our retention rates were higher. Our graduation rates were higher. And, and so was our affinity rates in regards to our alums uh, who were on traditional athletic teams are among our most passionate and generous alums is in regards to development. So we wanted to try to replicate that and we're looking for different areas. Over the last several years, we added seven sports teams and we really expanded our athletics and we wanted to continue doing that and creating teams on campus. We wanted more teams and teamwork in places where students can feel welcome and part of something bigger than just themselves and esports came up. The other thing that we really wanted to do was have since we had about a third of our students online we wanted them to offer them the opportunity to participate in athletics and certainly they, you know unless they were locally online they don't have that chance um, to do that in the traditional athletics atmosphere so we wanted to offer that to our online students and um, that's we're still working on that in terms of numbers we have a few uh, online students that are involved with our esports program seems like uh, many of them don't like the long commitment that it takes sometimes uh, with an esports team. So we've had better numbers when we just have tournaments for our online students, but we continue to work with them to get involved. But that was another reason why we wanted to start an esports program at SUNY Canton. You can see there, second to last, uh, second to last bullet point there was received grant funding from SUNY. So that was uh, that was big for us as well, and we'll probably get into. Um, the financial situation a little bit more as we progress, but uh, receiving a grant helped us dramatically also. And then hired a part-time coach. That was big. You know, when we when we talk about starting up an esports program, um, finding a champion on campus, finding someone who just loves to do this and will carry that torch for you is uh, is is one of the biggest things, as well as listening to the students and what they want. So uh, some of the most rewarding things that uh, we've done at SUNY Canton have been with our esports team over the last couple of years. I was just um, interviewing with a, a student who was uh, completing a survey and inter an internship, and and we were she was a traditional sports athlete, a lacrosse player, and, and I'm the I'm the uh, athletic director at SUNY Canton, and she asked me what was one of the most valuable things I've ever done or most rewarding things I've ever done while working at SUNY Canton, and this is it. I mean, esports is it. We transform lives more than anything I've ever experienced in my entire career. And, you know, I worked uh, in the NHL. I was a vice president for the Florida Panthers in the NHL for five years, and then transitioned to higher ed. And, you know, the swagger that um, those professional athletes, the swagger and the ego that they have, it's almost the exact opposite end of the spectrum when you talk about some some of our esports students. So that a lot of them will come in and they're shy, or they're not sure if they want to do this. They haven't been on a team in a while. They really enjoy the um, individual aspect of competing in, in uh, esports. 
But when we bring them in, it's just it's an unbelievable transformation to watch them grow and uh, to go from uh, an introvert to somebody who will get up and speak in front of groups. We had one high school assistant uh, superintendent uh, come up to me after they started their program two or three weeks. And, and she said, Randy, I've, I've got two students I've never heard speak before. And now that they're on the esports team, there's, they're, you know, I, I hear them speak. I hear them talking to their teammates and they're they're gaining in confidence. And all of a sudden they're standing up and they're walking, they're walking through the classroom sort of thing. It's just, it's just so rewarding and so much fun to see that. And I've never seen it uh, in anything else that I've ever done to the degree that esports has done that. So that it brings a lot of pride to us. And we talk about, I'm the, I'm the old guy, I'm the curmudgeon. I'm a guy that a lot of you, if you're just looking to start your esports program, whether it's K through 12 or higher ed, a lot of times it's that old traditional sports athletic director that says, whoa, this is not what we do. You know, we need to get those kids out there running laps and lifting weights and um, sitting at a computer is not what we do. But I would say, ask that athletic director why we have sports at our schools, whether it's K through 12 or in college. Why do we have sports? None of them are going to say they're looking to find the student with the highest free throw percentage or who can jump the highest or lift the most weights. It's all about things like teamwork and leadership and opportunities and uh, affinity to and social skills. And so all of those things that we bring to traditional athletics, esports has those, everything except the laps and the lifting weights, right? So, um, you know, it's so much value and there are so many students looking for something like this. The other thing I also tell people is, the most competitive person in your school might not be 6'4", 250 pounds and be able to bench press 300 pounds. That person might be five foot, 100 pounds, but will gnaw your arm off to win a League of Legends game. So, you know, don't think that our competition and being a strong competitor has anything to do with size. And we've learned that through esports as well. And that's part of the, my own growing experience, really, that has been just fantastic. So starting an esports team, this happened quickly for us uh, because we followed the lead of our students. We had a, a person on campus who um, believed in esports and was confident that we were it was going to be a great success, and we followed his lead as well. Um, so what I would recommend to schools who don't have an established esports team yet, or if you're somebody like me, a couple of years ago wondering how to what's the next step how do we start a team find somebody a faculty or a staff member or if you can't find anybody within your school you can look for, for a community member but um i suspect that you'd probably be able to find a faculty or staff member that is interested enough in this and can see the value in this to turn it around and sometimes it takes some talking to uh of a athletic director or somebody in student affairs or a faculty member a lot of it related folks um game uh, it's often, you know, it's it's clearly a younger uh, a younger demographic that game. So, yeah, don't ask me to help you with your League of Legends games, but I can help put teams together and I can help put students together, and that's why I think it fell so naturally into the athletic department at SUNY Canton because that's what we do. So we get coaches and we get uh, students who want to compete, and that's exactly what we did with esports. And again, the demand and interest for students is overwhelming. We I haven't met a school yet that has said, yeah, we tried to start an esports team and couldn't do it because of a lack of interest. Never. I haven't seen it once. Um, so find a champion on campus that will help um, just start things up. Sign ups, get get the students that are interesting, interested in a room, gauge the interest in what uh, games they want to play. There are, there are certain games that are really easy and popular to put together, inexpensive. Students can play from home if you have to just to start. And then if you develop something on your on your campus or in your school, uh, that that makes it all that greater of an experience because it is something special when you get them all in a room and competing the same way and you get that interaction. A lot of these students um, are used to competing alone in their room or you know just somewhere on their computer and when you bring them together, it is just awesome. I'll never forget the first time we traveled with our eSports team. We went to Albany for a tournament and our team walked into the room and the other colleges that were there, all the students just got together. It was, it was this immediate exchange of information. And it was like, where have you been all my life? Somebody just like me, you know, who loves gaming, loves this uh, 
type of competition and just these has these similar interests and it was fantastic and and as a result of that we try to get our esports team on the road at least once a semester so they can go out and um, meet some more more uh, folks in person and it's it's not dissimilar to our traditional student athletes we we travel with them we do it a lot less frequently with esports because you don't have to and and quite honestly we can't afford to travel all that much but we'll uh we'll get a um, college van travel down to albany or syracuse someplace like that they get to meet some other esports students and that's terrific maybe a little bit easier at the high school uh, level because you don't have to travel that far so i've already talked a little bit about the student experience in esports uh, it is phenomenal and the cool thing for me is it really we have some crossover traditional student athletes that play esports as well so we have a few of our men's soccer players that uh, play fifa one of our top scorers in men's hockey also plays fortnite he's quite a player for us in both uh, in both sports really um but for the most part these are these are a different type of student than our traditional student athletes that i'm used to dealing with and quite honest, honestly it's it's a very refreshing uh change at times to see all the different types of students that game and want to play and and have fun and they are so appreciative of having the opportunity it just it bowls you over uh they they have so much enthusiasm if uh, kyle and i go into the esports arena and unlock the door it, it's almost like it's a campus announcement that it's open because uh within minutes that we're flooded with students it's somehow it's almost like they've got a sixth sense on when that door is open and when they can come in and play because they love playing in the arena they love being together it's it's similar to you know basketball players want to play basketball all the time right and football players want to play football gamers want a game and they just love what they do and uh it's terrific if it can tie into a uh, an academic area for us we've got a few majors that it ties into but it's almost all stem majors have a real attraction toward gaming and that's been very good for us i saw one of the questions on the chat earlier about where where's the most ideal spot to put an esports arena uh, in your school or on your campus. And I would say, you know, if you have, wherever is, um, uh, you know, high traffic area is great. Campus center is ideal, but for us, it, it's in an academic area. We took an old computer lab, not that old, but we uh, we, we took a computer lab and transformed it into a, a, an esports arena in where uh, most of our engineering majors are. Uh, so one thing you do have to be careful of if you do put it in a uh, academic area is it does get noisy because students are yelling and hollering and having a great time and if that's uh, happening uh, while well, class is being offered that can be a conflict as well so uh we we actually open our arena up a little bit later on in the afternoon three or four o'clock when when some of the academics die down so we don't interrupt uh too many classes but the student athlete experience is uh is, is really difficult for me to capture in words how special it is and what it does for them and the social relationships that it builds and the transformations that we see and the opportunities to be positive mentors to each other and the pride when they had what they when they put the jersey on and they they're representing their school i think for most of them it's something that they never would have dreamt of growing up you know a lot of these students were told stop wasting your time uh playing games and now that they're in college and they have the opportunity to represent their school and compete with their school uh, jersey on it's just awesome and it, it really is a, a wonderful experience for them and for us to see it and to watch them as they as they grow individually these are the kind of students that we want to turn out um, after graduation right we want students who are competent who are have the ability to work uh, with a team have the social skills to do that are not afraid to uh, be a leader at times or at times sit back and let somebody else be a leader so those type of um, skills have been phenomenal for us to watch and and um, and see our students grow in that manner so this was a big day for us august 24 2018 we opened the doors to our esports arena and, and let our students in and you know i can i can let kyle talk a little bit about this because he was you know he's our it person and somehow got involved with paint selection and uh, wall hangings and all sorts of non-it things that really make what we uh we think our esports arena is very special uh, 
But when it comes to all of the uh, equipment and technology stuff, I'm lost on it, right? So similar to the, the, the sports that I oversee at SUNY Canton, I let our coaches and our specialists handle that. Kyle was certainly uh, the guy to handle all of that um, from an IT perspective and equipment perspective for us. So I guess, I'll, Kyle, I'll let you talk a little bit about um, what we did to get the arena open, some of the technology stuff and equipment stuff, and then just what a great feeling it was when we finally opened those doors. Sure. Thanks, Randy. Yeah, so we we started planning, uh, as Randy talked about, um, um, you know, we, we actually started the esports program up within about a month. Um, we were using a, an existing computer lab uh, that was being used uh, for graphics design curriculum, so it had high-end um, workstations in there. Uh, but we quickly realized uh, with the momentum that we had that we needed a dedicated space. Uh, we needed that marketing, that PR, that wow factor, and we needed gaming specific um, uh, uh, machines and technologies in order to support you know, our, our long term goals for the program. Uh, so we took what was uh, uh, an underutilized um, multipurpose room uh, that had very little infrastructure um, and turned it into an 1800 square foot arena. Um, at the time, it was the largest installation of Alienware machines in, in northeastern U.S., according to uh, Dell and Alienware. Uh, consisted of 25 machines, um, extremes networking. Uh, as, as you've seen in the pictures, we have uh, console stations along the wall where we have five flat screens uh, installed. Um, we put the professional version of, of the console stations in there, PS4 Pros, Xbox One Xs, and most recently added Nintendo Switches uh, for competitive play. Um, it has been a showstopper. Um, our admissions open house uh, tours, uh, the students are fascinated. Um, anytime you're in the room, uh, there's a large window into the hallway, and anyone that's visiting campus that walks by instantly stops and presses their face up against the window to look in. Uh, it's it's really, uh, really a great uh, tool for the campus uh, for recruitment. Um, the I think we can move on to the next slide. So this is just uh, our grand opening, um, and this is uh, SUNY Chancellor Johnson uh, was nice enough to visit our campus, uh, and uh, on, so happened on that same day we had our grand opening with a ribbon cutting for the space. Um, these are some of our esports team players in the background, um, and uh, uh, you'll actually there's a video available of this grand opening that captures the student reactions. Uh, the first time seeing it, we we really went out of the way to keep everybody out of the space to until it was fully complete. Um, we had paper up on the windows, on the doors. No one was allowed in, uh, and we revealed it all in, in one fell swoop. And uh, if you visit our our website, uh, Canton.edu, um, you can find the esports page and, and a bunch of videos there, including the um, esports arena reveal video, which is fascinating. Next slide, please. <coughs> OK, on the next one, please. So clearly we've been uh, very fortunate to watch our enrollment grow uh, once we started with eSports and, and it's been a, a terrific relationship between uh, the, major, the academic majors that we offer and the interest in eSports. So as you can see, we, we have um, a few majors that we feel that are very much directly related to esports and its growth. So our game design major, graphic and multi uh, gra graphic and multimedia design major, um, cybersecurity, we have a telecommunications major as well. Um, and now we this year will be our first year offering an esports management major. And we're excited about that. But you can see the growth in enrollment in those majors since we started in 2017. We went from 67 students up to 250. You see the growth of our esports uh, team when we when we originally started the team and, and uh, cut down to about 17 competitors because we started with three different games. We started with League of Legends, Overwatch, and Hearthstone. If you don't know what those are, I didn't either, and I still couldn't play them. But those were the three games that uh, I still can't play them. But those are the three games that we started with. We've since expanded to eight games now on campus. But you see how our esports team grew as well from 17 members to when we just started out to 45 members uh, within a couple of semesters and then around 100 now and that we had to cut about 50 students who wanted to be part of our esports team uh, this year just because we didn't have enough computers and enough uh, computer time really to house more than 100 of them and even that was a stretch we've had to really be diligent about practice times and when teams can come in and come out um, and so we keep our esports arena open late uh, and by that usually about 11 o'clock or so 
sometimes later and now we've opened it up on the weekends as well just trying to meet the demand that's the big been the our biggest challenge is meeting the demand it hasn't been getting students to come in and play it's meeting the demand of those students that are that are here so um, it's a great thing for students who were already on our campus like i said we got an overwhelming demand right away and then the the um, recruitment of new players and new students has been just phenomenal so it's been a lot of fun to watch So we talk about our students in academic majors and some opportunities and, and uh, you know, the media explosion that it's had. We, I, I think our PR folks took a look at some of what they thought was the media value that we've received from eSports. It's been out of this world. We've been on ABC Nightline. It's, for, uh, it's the first I know of that our, our, our small college in upstate New York in the middle of a very rural area, um, almost a near, can almost Canada, I guess you could describe us. And uh, I, I think it's the first time you're on a, a national TV show like ABC Nightline. It certainly hasn't been very often, but we were in all of those uh, newspapers, all sorts of uh, television coverage and things, things like that. So it's been wonderful for us as we've capitalized on this. Um, that's not the main reason we did it, but it's certainly been uh, terrific to uh, really experience that. And um, I, I think more and more our esports are going to be covered like our traditional sports as it, it as we progress as well. So um, that's been that's been nice too. And then this SUNY tournament that we're coordinating right now has has uh, really started to gar garner some uh, significant media as well. We're in the New York Times over the weekend uh, when we've got some other national media um, interested in this tournament. So we'll look to capitalize on that too. So it's been a lot of fun and it's uh, it's interesting to see uh, how much interest it's generated outside of campus as well. So that was the uh, estimated number that our PR department had and that was as of uh, geez, it was probably about a month or a month or two ago. So that number has grown since and will probably grow significantly as we're tied in with the SUNY uh, chancellor tournament so it's been it's been great and um, I know our administration is happy that uh, they've got a, a nice return on their dollar as well other marketing efforts you know we uh, extreme has been uh, phenomenal partners with us throughout and we uh, we love uh, working with extreme uh, not just because what they've done for our campus and for our esports uh, players, but also uh, the way they've helped us and the way they've helped our esports team grow. Uh, so they've been um, our number one teammate in, in watching this grow. Uh, ECAC uh, has been a nice uh, partner as well in regards to uh, that's where we usually play our, our leagues and our championships is the Eastern Collegiate Ath Athletic Conference, which was a, a good partner of ours with traditional athletics and now they've they've uh, really started with esports but as uh, was mentioned earlier by rob you know you can find whether it's national or state or local esports organizations to compete and uh, the great thing is you can compete against anybody we've competed with teams all over the world and all over the united states so that makes it a lot of fun too and it makes it easy uh, so there are organizations out there the um national uh what is the NACE it's called? So it's National Association of Collegiate Esports is NACE. Um, they're another option as well, although we really do like the ECAC for our, our competition. Um, and so we were also in the New York State Museum of Esports. That was cool. And the Mountain Dew Game Field has been a, a, a nice partner for us as well. So those are just some of the some of the um, partners that we've had. But you'll be surprised if you're looking for um, um, some sponsors or some help, you'll be surprised at the number of folks throughout your community that are interested in something like this because they realize the passion that the esports uh, players have. So as Rob mentioned, I'm big into the videos. This was uh, this is one done by uh, Mountain Dew Game Fuel. Uh, they actually um, they were one of their top schools I guess so you know how Nike will sponsor North Carolina or Duke and you know with their uh, basketball shoes and stuff like that we feel kind of important when it comes to esports and, and we'll, we have sponsors like uh, Mountain Dew Game Fuel they'll actually send us product and our, our students feel like they're big wigs getting to drink game fuel for uh, free on occasion but it, 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 it's interesting that the um, marketing efforts from uh, folks uh, and companies that kind of recognize what's coming here and uh, they want to get in early on it. So the, uh, the industry in the future, you know, they, 
it's uh, it's growing beyond our wildest dreams, and it just has in the past couple of years. And uh, Rob had that graphic up about twenty some percent of schools that have esports now, and and seventy some percent that uh, don't yet. I think within two or three years, we're going to see those numbers just flip. Uh, I'll be shocked if uh, if they don't. Um, we're helping uh, K through twelve and in colleges start up programs every week. Um, and it's just going to continue to grow like that. There's no question in my mind, and I think we're going to be able to offer these types of opportunities to more and more students. And it's not just happening in high schools, but it's happening in middle schools as well. And actually, some of the best players in the world are high schoolers um, because their uh, because their uh, their reflexes are so quick at that age. Um, as a matter of fact, people say that. Uh, esports gamers peak at about uh, 17 or 18. So it's uh, not unlike some other traditional sports like gymnastics or swimming, where oftentimes you'll see some players peak at a young age. Um, but certainly their love for gaming, um, you know, that it starts young and it, it can last old. As a matter of fact, we had an alumni call our alumni office wanting to play some of our students. He's 85 years old, like to game. So it's kind of a neat connection there. So as I mentioned, we have a number of different majors at SUNY Canton that um, are churning out esports students, and we look forward to helping them um, get out early uh, in esports and become involved. And uh, uh, there's so many different opportunities that are out there, and, and it's growing, and it's growing every week, and we see it like that, and we're looking forward to um, graduating our esports uh, players, it, not just in esports management major, but in other majors that will uh, end up working in the esports industry. And as you can see by the numbers there and the opportunities there that are listed, um, it's limitless. And so if you think about all the schools that offer sports management type of majors and uh, whether it's sports broadcasting or sports marketing or sports information directors, tournament directors, that sort of thing, those things are going to exist in esports as well not too far down the road. So we look forward to uh, many of our students um, filling in those majors, but it's just going to be opportunities for students as it continues to grow and grow. So that's kind of more more of the same and, and some more big numbers and really numbers that are hard to uh, wrap your head around, but the popularity of esports and and how um, you know the esports championships uh, will oftentimes um, have more viewers than, say, the Super Bowl or Wimbledon and things like that. So um, those numbers are staggering, but it, they're numbers that are, are real and are going to continue to grow. So I mentioned a little bit about the future of esports, at least what we think in uh, uh, K through 12 and collegiate esports. Uh, I, I think it's going to be a given that we're going to see more and more and more schools continue to do this and see the value in it. We certainly see the value in it. We will all also get a question of, well, what about a student who's just going to game all day long and then fail out of school? Well, you could say that about any um, any organization or any student activity that you have if somebody goes overboard with it. So time management is something that we pay a lot of attention to with our eSports students, just like we do with our traditional student athletes. If an athlete isn't going to class, if he is struggling in uh, class or if she's um, not her, turning in her assignments, that sort of thing, we're on it. And we have coaches that are on it as well. So we actually can monitor our eSports students better than just our general students. So we get reports coming into us. I do as an athletic director that I, I, I hand over to the coaches, both with traditional student athletes and eSports students. So we monitor their academics. They can't play unless they're in good academic standing at our school. So that gives them some incentive to make sure they take care of things in the classroom. Otherwise, they can't game. And if they can't game, it's one of the things they love the most. So similar to, say, a basketball player who may just want to play basketball, He's got to go to class or she's got to go to class. They've got to get their work done in order to be eligible to play. It's the same thing in eSports. So in that regard, I think it helps us monitor their academic progress. You can see the viewership is uh, is crazy and it's going to continue to grow. Um, and, you know, I think that uh, within, a, within a few years, you may see eSports at the top of that graph. Again, more staggering numbers about the predictions of uh, growth and future of esports, not just in uh, participants, but in um, viewership. 
and and we'll see that as well. You know, it's been great too to watch some parents with uh, pride to watch their students or watch their kids for the first time compete like that. It's pretty neat. So I think Rob, this is going to uh, open it up to uh, a lot of questions. And I and I saw in the chats that we had uh, a number of questions. One was, uh, what are the most popular games? Um, and and I, I think we mentioned a few. Um, the games really that uh, League of Legends seems to be very popular. Still, Overwatch is very popular. Um, some easy ones to put together would be Smash Brothers, Fortnite, and Rocket League. Those are really popular right now. They're really easy to put together. There's there's the, you compete in smaller team numbers. Uh, Fortnite you can do duos, which is two team members. Smash Brothers and Rocket League you can do three. Some of the other games have a little bit more, and then many of them are are individual games too. So it all depends on. Um, when you have that meeting and you want you ask your students what are they playing what are they interested in follow their lead on it they're, they're going they're going to take you for the ride on that one and it's going to be a lot of fun NBA 2k and Madden are big uh, uh, FIFA are big I like those sports games because I can understand them some of these other games I can't understand I'll watch them scratching my head a little bit but um, I can see that they're loving it and understanding it so just like um, I don't understand all the rules in field hockey um, I don't understand all the rules in uh, uh, some of these games that they play, but um, it's uh, it's extremely valuable. Kyle, one of the questions that was on the chat was, uh, what's the total monetary investment for SUNY for esports in year one and year two? And that's a difficult question to ask because it's all based on whether or not you actually want to build an arena, whether you want to buy just a couple of computers, or whether students are going to um, compete from home on their own computers. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we we decided to go all in at the very beginning of this initiative. Uh, we had full support from our executive team, which is um, uh, it, it doesn't happen very often, at least in, in what we hear uh, from from other institutions going down this path. Uh, we had full support from our VPs and our president um, uh, across the board to um, invest heavily in this, knowing we would have an ROI on the back end uh, down the road. So we uh, we spent just over four hundred thousand dollars total. Now, keep in mind, uh, we had a bare bones space uh, with no uh, HVAC, uh, minimal electrical, limited data. Um, we had to run an uh, entirely new uh, circuits for power, um, all the networking infrastructure, all the lighting. Um, we had to address the cooling issues in the room. Uh, so that the construction was actually a, a large part of our expense. Um, we did order custom furniture. Uh, I believe we spent about $25,000 on furniture. Um, and each gaming setup uh, that we have was uh, around $5,000. So that's the, the monitor the PC, the peripherals, and the chair. Um, I'd also like to note that, again, because we we wanted to make a splash and have a very competitive space, we went with the top of the line Alienware machines that were out there. Um, we wanted them to be usable beyond um, you know, two years, uh, hopefully three to four. Uh, so we went with the very top of the line and we spared no expense. Now, on the flip side of that, we've worked with institutions and helped guided them and, you know, down their journey um, where they essentially have a volunteer um, coach um, who's helping out the organization and uh, they have, you know, 10 or 12 PCs that have been surplused from from their institution uh, and they have them set up in a, in a spare room or a shared space where uh, where, you know, that's that's their arena. Um, so there's there's minimal investment and it, it really uh, goes across the, the board as to, um, you know, what your goals are, uh, you know, how much you want to invest, what, what your expected outcomes are. Um, do you see this as a big marketing PR push? Does it tie to your academic programs? Do you view this as a rec recruitment and retention tool? All of those factors play into, um, you know, how you want to invest and how much you want to invest in your program. So, Katie, I don't know if you wanted to um, ask some questions or read some of the questions from the chat, but another one that I saw, Kyle, was uh, any experience running esports machines using Microsoft virtual desktops? It, it's funny you should ask that because uh, Rob and I kind of kicked that around when uh, all the campuses around us started closing. Um, we have not gone down the path. Uh, we, ha we had some higher priority projects to tackle, um, but I think in the future, that's something we would certainly test out, you know, in the event that we have to, um, uh, you know, hold virtual classes again and, and close off our, our campus. Uh, so yeah, that's, it's a good question. Um, haven't done it yet, but I, I see Rob's uh, start, his, his gears are turning. He wants to do it next, so. <laughs> we'll figure something out. We, we have remote connectivity, so if, uh, you know, with, with the current situation we have right now, 
we actually have uh, branch kits and things like that for for healthcare. You know, setting up those remote tents, remote communications. So uh, Kyle and I had conversations. Well, what about all these students that really want to get into that arena? Um, you know, we could put together uh, the right elements, if you will. You know, uh, connectivity to those computers, so you can open up the arena and have a student sitting in their home, and they're actually playing on that high-end gaming computer. Um, that is something that uh, we could look at, but uh, yeah, we do have remote uh, capabilities from Extreme. You know, when you talk about virtual, I, I, I look at virtual reality, and I think that's inevitably coming down the road, Rob, as, as the technology and all of this continues to increase, and, and, and virtual competitions will be uh, very interesting as well, too. It might actually combine the physical aspects of some traditional reality. sports and then, uh, and then uh, um, gaming. So. Uh, I think I think we're going to see that you know, whether it's you know two years down the road or five, but that will be interesting. Yeah, there's it's it's definitely going to keep going and evolving. Absolutely. Was there any other questions out there, Katie? I don't know if Katie's muted. I, I see there's a question. Um, what platforms are most popular to young students uh, slash people to facilitate play? I, I think I'd say right now the most popular platform is the Nintendo Switch for personal use. Super Smash Brothers is wildly popular and um, it's a, a low cost of entry for a student to purchase a Switch, um, you know, versus a, a you know, three, four, five thousand uh, dollar PC. Uh, and they're extremely mobile. They can pick them up, put them in their backpack, take them to school, play with other players, plug them into a docking station, use a large monitor. Um, so right now that's, that's uh, uh, in my mind, probably the most popular console game out there. Hmm. There was a question about Steam on there that I'm not particularly familiar with, so I don't know if you saw that one, Kyle or Rob. It says Steam is wide open for public use and access any games, chat, etc., and has been required for Rocket League to be used. Are we able to use Rocket League without Steam now or able to lock Steam to private use only and not allow students to download games available, all games available that they may or may not own? So, you know, we talked, I think originally, Kyle, didn't we have some issues with students downloading other, other games into our Alienware and we wanted to make sure that we weren't overloaded with that. I don't know if this that's related to this question. Yeah, it is, and that's that is a challenge. Um, Steam is required for Rocket League, uh, and and Steam and some of the other applications uh, um, can't be um, built into the image. Uh, they can't be um, managed downloads. Uh, the user actually logs into their account and can download them independently. Uh, without requiring administrator password on the computer, um, that has been a challenge, and we've addressed that, you know, with with people basically, our esports co coordinator and our uh, volunteer coaches and team captains that facilitate practice and, and gaming sessions uh, um, self-regulate. Um, you know, they they know that they're not supposed to download those things, uh, and we always have that supervision available, uh, uh, you know, to to make sure that. Um, uh, we're, we're maintaining at least a minimal level of security. Uh, you know that that balance of security and playability um, is, is certainly a challenge. There, there's no doubt. Um, as Rob mentioned earlier, everything from the firewall and policy-based down to the application level. Um, you know, with things like Steam and, and how do we how do we manage those? So, any sort of competitive environment that you have dedicated to esports um, is going to be a fine balance. Um, and you know, for those reasons, uh, you know, we are. Um, you know, looking at what the next evolution may be, whether it's a whole dedicated ISP uh, for our competitive gaming space, whether it's a, a direct home run connection to, uh, the, uh, you know, the edge of our firewall and then out, out to our CDN network. Um, those are all, all design considerations that we're exploring, you know, as, as this continues to grow. Yeah, and uh, if, I, if I could add, um, you know, if you're looking for some central management, uh, central updating uh, service, yes, yeah, Steam is one of them. Uh, much like you know, in higher ed, fog and in ghost uh, for doing up, um, you know, upgrades to your uh, images of your computers and things like that. So you have a, a distributed model where maybe you can do some multicast out to make it efficient on the network. So anything around there that you can look into around esports and the gaming is uh, definitely something you want to do. If if you're trying to do the updates through the internet, like Kyle mentioned, we have seen you know if you have 25 computers trying to do. Uh, image upgrades, uh, it is going to saturate your internet link. So you do have to take that into consideration and watch that and maybe, you know, control that bandwidth or 
you know, not allow it to happen until it's like off hours or something like that, or have a separate internet connection. Yeah, that's a great point. And and we manage that again with with a person at the beginning. Uh, right. So our, our requiring admin uh, credentials to uh, um, do those updates and we would only do four to five machines at a time. Uh, there is a, a an open source uh, cache server um, out there that we've started uh, exploring. So we'll look at um, hosting that on our campus. Uh, you know, similar to the cache servers you can do for Apple updates. Um, so we're not quite there yet, but I think that's going to be, um, uh, you know, another another great tool for us. It only seems fitting that a couple of guys, uh, Kwiatkowski and Siminski, answer a question from Losinski. Um, and I hope I didn't mispronounce your name. But are there state and national athletic associations involved? And if so, do they require network ability levels and arena setup structure? So yes, there are you know state and national associations for esports. They're easy to find if you Google them. Um, and there's actually a coaching organization as well out there for uh, coaches to uh, gather around. So all of that stuff is very helpful. So you don't feel like you're on your own. And some of them also can include information about just trying to start up. I don't believe there's any network avail ability levels that are required. Um, you know, students are able to compete whether it's at home or at, at uh, in their school. So I don't think there's a minimum of that. And then arena setup structure, there there usually isn't a requirement there. It it is a big advantage though. You know, our students have a big advantage over some of the other schools that we compete against because of the combination of Alienware and Extreme Networks. So when they press a button, it's instantaneous. There is no latency or lag time there, and it's it's a terrific um, advantage for them to be able to compete. But um, that doesn't mean that uh, you can't still do it from home. Um, students certainly do that. Schools certainly do that. And of course, if you take a look at our SUNY tournament right now that we're competing with 46 different schools, everybody's competing from home. You know, so um, it's a it's it's a factor, and it can be uh, it can be a big benefit for you. Or um, if you don't have those those setups. Um, you have to be at that much better at the game sometimes, um, but certainly I don't think there's these minimum requirements that you're asking about. So I think the last question I see here, Randy, is uh, um, are esports programs, are they commonly housed in campus recreation? Yeah, and, and so I'm not sure if they're talking about the building or, you know, the 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 campus infrastructure, so to speak, or you know what department it falls under. So I, I think I mentioned earlier in regards to buildings, um, ours is located in an academic building in, in the esports arena or where you meet can be located anywhere on campus. And for a lot of schools, whether it's K through 12 or colleges, the challenge is to find a place. Um, and so uh, you find that place and you make it your own and your students will walk across campus to get there. I don't think it's a problem of where it's housed. Um, because they will they will get there and they will come with a lot of enthusiasm. Um, in regards to um, who should run esports, and, and that might be where this question is leading. Should it be student affairs? Should it be athletics? Um, should it be somewhere else? And, and there is a mix there. And I think the percentages are about 40, 40, 20, 40% 40 of the esports teams are being run through athletic departments like they do at SUNY Canton. We think it's a perfect fit for us. 40% are more along the lines of student activities or somewhere in student affairs. And then there's 20% 20, 20 other, which um, could be just about any other place on campus, IT departments, um, academic areas, that sort of thing. I'd say, you know, wherever, wherever it's going to work for you to make it work, it's worked really well in athletics at SUNY Canton, just because, like I said, we're used to putting teams together. We're used to um, bringing coaches in and recruiting students and student athletes. And, and so that's, we felt we could do that. And it certainly was uh, within our specialty and uh, it worked out really well for us. So sometimes you'll see some um, athletic directors and I still see it all the time, uh, athletic directors who just want to frown on esports and, and uh, you know, I just, I need a little time with them to convince them otherwise, or they just have to, they have to go watch and watch those students compete. And it usually turns them around and opens their mind up a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think it, it can work wherever you can, wherever you want to make it work. All right. Hey guys, I think we, this has been a phenomenal session. So great dialogue, great interaction, great questions. And appreciate you know everybody attending today. And a big thanks to Kyle, Randy, and Robert, our presenters. Um, if you want to send your contact info again to Katie and Michelle, 
We'll follow up with a link to the recording of this webinar, as well as answers to all the questions that were in the chat window and sent in. So again, great dialogue, great webinar, great content. Thank you to our presenters and thank you for attending. Thanks for having us, everybody. Really appreciate it. Sorry we couldn't do this in person. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.